So welcome to the Biology 160. This is your first lecture on Chapter 1. So this is going to correspond with your lecture material in your Campbell's Biology book, or if you're using the open source materials, all of the chapters will coordinate with the chapter or the unit in the lecture notes, along with what you'll find in the book, and then also what you'll find as the resources in your library of materials that you can look things up under this unit on Canvas. So this first chapter we look at what is life. It's an introduction. Biology is the study of life and the way this book is going to present the information is looking at it through the eyes of evolution. How is life transformed on Earth over time? Since when you're looking at things that are alive we don't have any magic ingredient that makes things alive. Instead, what we will do is look at properties that are associated with life. These are not necessarily black and white. So not all of these properties are always going to be there in something that's alive. And you may see some of these properties in things that are not alive as well. So things that are alive are going to have ordered structure. So here to the right in the sunflower, you can see that there is ordered structure to the way it's arranged. If you look at a human, all of us look slightly different, but there is an order. We all have two eyes, a nose, and a mouth, and they're all in relatively close to the same place on our face, but we still look different. You'll see evolutionary adaptation. Things that are alive have adapted and modified over time. They're going to respond to their environment and change in response to environment. So in this picture to the right, it's showing the Venus flytrap here responding to an insect landing. We respond to our environment in many different ways. So one way that you would respond is if it's cold, you're going to shiver. Living things are able to reproduce. So part of the cell theory says that all living cells come from cells. All cells are made from other cells, essentially, and there's no other way of getting it. And all living things are made up of cells. We're going to have metabolism. Metabolism is how we process energy. It's all of the chemical reactions that are going on in the cells. And then things are going to grow and develop over time. So you will see as time progresses that organisms are going to get bigger. Fortunately, we don't start out as full-size humans when we're born. We start out as smaller humans that grow and develop over time. Okay, so the biological hierarchy is going to extend from the microscopic scale all the way to the entire planet. What this essentially means is that as you look at things, the hierarchy is going to get more complex as you move up the chain. So as you go from the simpler things, which are microscopic, you're going to have simpler interactions. As you move up to larger living organisms, they're going to be more complex interactions. And then as you look at the entire planet, you're going to have even more complex interactions. We say that there's emergent properties. So novel properties that you'll see as you move up to more complex organisms that were not there at the preceding level. So not only is the organism themselves going to have more complex arrangements, but they're going to have more complex interactions with their more complex parts. When you look at things, we will use reductionism to do this. You'll reduce the complex systems into simpler parts to study. Part of the reason we do this is it's just, frankly, too much information and very overwhelming to look at the whole thing at once. So this allows us to study things in smaller parts. However, there is some limits to doing this because you can't explain the higher levels. For example, Watson and Crick, they established the molecular structure of DNA. That was a very important discovery, but it does not include or explain the interactions of DNA. So when looking at this, these things, it is important to balance reductionism with more of a holistic approach so that you can look at the larger scale of emerging properties. So how we study a lot of times is systems biology, where we're going to study the components and their functions together at various organization levels. So when we look at the interactions between the organisms and their physical environments, they're going to continually interact with the ecosystem. So they're going to be both affected by the interactions with each other and between the ecosystem. For example, mineral and rocks are going to form the soil for the plants. So as the roots from the plants start to grow, they're going to break up the rocks to help provide more water and minerals. Carbon dioxide is going to be taken into a plant 
and then the plant is going to release oxygen. Animals, in turn, are going to take in the oxygen and release the carbon dioxide. Insects and animals are going to eat the plants, and then when they die and decay, the minerals will be returned back to the soil. So nutrients are always going to cycle in the ecosystem. All of the nutrients that are there now have always been there, and as far as we know, will always be there. They will just be in different forms or in different places. With global climate change, we see an increase in temperature and weather patterns around the, the planet. To expect that our planet is not going to change is not very realistic. As far back in history as we can note, this planet has gradually been changing. It has never been static. So to think that it's going to be static in the future is not very likely. The organisms that have lived on this planet have changed throughout history. To expect that that's going to not be the case in the future and that we're going to be here forever is probably not a very realistic approach to things. Everything else has had its time on the planet and has died off eventually as well. So when we look at the energy transfer and transformation, we categorize things as producers and consumers for our big general categories. The producers are going to absorb their light energy and they will transform it into chemical energy. Plants are a good example of this, where they're going to absorb energy from light and they will turn it into sugars to store that energy. With the transfer of energy, you're going to have that chemical energy of food transferred to the consumers, who are going to use it for both their heat. So your consumers are the organisms that are going to feed on the producers and other consumers. Examples of these would be animals, whether they're eating other animals or plants, they're going to use the energy they get from those to do work and to generate heat. When looking at anatomy and physiology, as well as anything with the cell, we see that form fits function. The anatomy of life fits its function at all structural levels. If you have a structure, there's a reason for it. Cells are the basic unit or structure of life. Characteristics of all cells are going to include that they're enclosed by a membrane. That membrane is going to regulate what goes in and out of the cell, and all cells are going to have DNA as their genetic information. The cells fall into two main categories, your prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells. Eukaryotic cells are this example here that's a little bit larger. So your prokaryotic cells are going to be this example here that's a little smaller. The eukaryotic cells have internal membranes that are going to separate the nucleus of the organelles. The prokaryotic cells, the DNA is not separated by a membrane. It has a particular region that it hangs out in, but it also does not have any membrane-bound organelles. What we see in life is things are going to be heritable and we see continuity between generations. This is going to be possible because of your DNA, your deoxyribonucleic acid that's your genetic information. Genes are made of the DNA. They are the unit of inheritance. They're going to code for the proteins. The proteins are going to make up the structures. So when you're going to get similar instructions to make similar structures, they're going to end up very similar, hence giving you the continuity. When we look at DNA, it's going to take on several different forms depending on where the cell is in its life. The chromosome is a very long strand of DNA that has hundreds of genes on it. This is only present during cell division, although when you picture the genetic information, what probably comes to mind is a chromosome. The genes are the actual instructions to build the proteins or other molecules, so they are located on the chromosomes. And they are both made out of DNA. Proteins are going to be what create the structures, so they will also carry out cellular work and give the cell its identity. So the function of a chromosome is it's going to replicate as the cell prepares to divide. This way each of the offspring can inherit a complete set of the genes. Your DNA is that central database that is going to be your instructions for everything the cell does. So here you've got your DNA in the nucleus. It's showing it being the double helix shape. And just a single strand of it, you've got these nucleotides here that are going to code for making all of the proteins. So the molecular structure of DNA is it's a double-stranded helix with four nucleotides. We abbreviate them as A, T, C, and G, adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. 
their specific arrangement is going to encode for the information in genes. So just like the specific arrangement of the letters that you put in a word codes for the information, it's going to be the same thing with the genes. So gene expression refers to the DNA of a gene's controlling protein production indirectly. It's going to do this indirectly because it uses an RNA intermediary that's going to direct the production of the cellular products. The RNA intermediary, you can think of it being like a photocopy. If your DNA is your master set of instructions for things, you don't want to pull out that master set of instructions for everything. You're better off to keep that safe, make a photocopy of the section that you need, and use that to build something. That's what the RNA intermediary is like, is that photocopy. So when we look at genomics, genomes are the entire library of genetic instructions an organism inherits. The genome is, does not specify what form the genetic information is in. Genomics is the study of the sets of genes and compares the genomes of species rather than just a single gene. Genetics is more focused on the individual genes. These days we use a lot of high throughput technology to rapidly analyze biological materials very quickly, such as automated DNA sequencing machines. Part of the reason for this is we can get the information so much quicker by having it being automated. With bioinformatics, we use computers to store, analyze, and organize the data. So the amount of data we have is very overwhelming for the human mind to process. If you could imagine having a printed out PDF file that is over a thousand pages and I were to ask you to highlight the word the throughout all thousand pages of that document. That would be a pretty tedious experience. However, with a PDF file on a computer, what you can do is use the search mode and have it search for the word the. You press a button and in less than a few seconds, you're going to have the document back with the word the highlighted in there every place in that thousand page document for you. It's similar to that type of thing when you look at the scale of information that we have to process. Computers have made that way easier for us and allowed us to analyze the data in ways that we haven't before. So even information that we've already had for several years, we weren't able to process it and integrate large volumes of information together until being able to use the computer to organize that information. A lot of times research teams are going to be more interdisciplinary now. You'll have diverse groups of specialists working on the information together. So not only do you have the biologist who's going to actually be doing the studying and carrying out the research, but you're going to have people that will work on the computers, write the software that you need. You would have statisticians that can help to analyze the data, rather than having one person try and do everything together. So one of the things that living things like to do is regulate what's going on through feedback mechanisms. Homeostasis is just the attempt to keep a constant or stable environment, and that's what living things like to do. So it can do this through negative feedback loops. Negative feedback loops are by far the most common. They detect a change and attempt to reverse it. So if you have a product that accumulates at the end, its process, its products can actually slow down the process of making it. So if we look over here to the right, we've got a negative feedback loop where you start with step A, there's an enzyme that converts it to B, then to C, then to D. If the products at the end D start to build up, what can happen is they can actually come in and inhibit this first step here and say, hey, we've got enough, go ahead and slow down production. As we start to use up those products, then it's no longer available to block the production and you can have production start again. So this is a very common mechanism in living systems. With positive feedback, here you detect a change and it reinforces it or speeds up. So here it's showing where you have a product that's going to come along and it's going to give positive feedback to increase the production even more. There's only a few examples of these. One is with human blood clotting. So if you spring a leak in the system, you need to speed up the clotting reactions or you will continue to lose blood. 
during the labor and delivery process, if you don't increase the uterine contractions, the baby's never going to come out. Those are pretty much the two examples that you'll find commonly used for positive feedback loops. So evolution is going to explain the unity and diversity of organisms. Today, what you see are organisms that are all modified descendants of a common ancestor. So it does not say that anybody came from monkeys. It's saying that all the organisms today had other organisms that they came from and have become modified over time. When we look at the diversity of life, so far we've identified about 1.8 million species. Each year, thousands are identified. It's estimated we have between 10 million to over 100 million. It's hard for us to know exactly, and it may seem that it's pretty unrealistic to identify thousands of new species every year. You can't really imagine there being that many cute fuzzy things in the woods. And those aren't usually what we're finding. A lot of times what we find is microscopic. With microscopic organisms, they all look alike. You don't necessarily even know that you're sitting on them. So where you're sitting right now, there could be some unidentified bacteria species there that we've never identified before. You can't see it with the naked eye to even question that it's there. If you did look at it underneath the microscope and you stained it, it could have an appearance exactly like thousands of other bacteria. We wouldn't know it was anything different unless we looked at the genetic sequence or did some biochemical tests. So that makes it a little bit more difficult to identify things when, to what we look at with the naked eye, they may look exactly the same. <coughs> Taxonomy is how we name and classify species. It's based on shared characteristics. It goes from more general to more specific. So if we start over here, we've got the domain. It will become more specific to the kingdom phylum, class, order, family, and genus and species. When we name things, we usually use a binomial nomenclature when we refer to things, so we talk about the genus and the species. So Homo sapiens for humans, Escherichia coli for the E. coli bacteria. You're going to use both names. You can think of it as similar to using a first and last name. There's probably several other people that share your first name, several other people that share your last name, but you really do narrow it down a lot when you use your first and last name together. <coughs> so we have three domains of life. These are based on your DNA sequences. They're the bacteria, the archaea, and the eukarya. Both the bacteria and the archaea are prokaryotes. The archaea are nearly as similar to the eukarya as they are to the bacteria. They're a very unique group. The eukarya has three domains of multicellular organisms, and we distinguish them by how they eat. Animals are going to take in food by ingestion. Fungi consume dead matter. They more absorb it than eating it or swallowing it like we do. Plants are going to produce their sugars from photosynthesis. And the protists are a diverse group of single-celled organisms. They get split into several groups themselves. So when we look at the diversity of life, we also see a lot of unity. If you look at the vertebrates, we all have similar skeletons. If you were to take and look at your arm and shoulder complex down to your hand, you'd see that you've got a clavicle and that you have your humerus, one bone in the top. You've got two bones in your forearm, your radius and ulna. You've got seven bones in your wrist, five bones in your hand, and five digits. If you look at your dog, it's going to look exactly the same. You're going to have your clavicle, the scapula, just like you do in the shoulder complex for you, one bone, a humerus, two bones in the forearm, seven in the wrist, five across the hand, and five digits. So they may change in length or width. When you look at your dog, you may go, no, they don't have five fingers or five toes. Remember, there's the declaw. It sits a little bit higher up on the dog's arm. So to us, it looks like it's on the dog's forearm, and it really still is on the dog's foot. So Charles Darwin is the one who's given most of the credit for the evolutionary view of life. In 1859, he published his book on the origin of species by means of natural selection. He was not the only one with these ideas by a long shot. There were others that were working on similar materials. 
Darwin got word of it, got on the ball, and got his materials published first. So most of the credit goes to him, even though he was not the only one with those ideas. In The Origin of Species, he has two main points. The contemporary species arose from a succession of ancestors. Basically, you had descent with modification. And two, natural selection is the mechanism of evolution. Darwin had some key observations that helped him come up with these ideas. He noticed that individuals in a, trait, in a population have variations in traits. So if you were to look at humans, we all have two eyes, but our eyes are going to have varying traits. Where they will appear slightly different. <coughs> a population can produce far more offspring than go on to survive and produce their own offspring. If you look at rabbits, for example, every six to eight weeks you're going to get a new generation of rabbits. Most of them do not survive and go on to produce additional rabbits. However, the species that are better adapted to their environment are the ones who are more likely to survive. So it's inferred that those who are better adapted to the environment are more likely to survive. They're more likely to reproduce and pass those genes on to their offspring. So when we look at natural selection, the natural environment selects for the propagation of certain traits in the population. And the cumulative effects of this could cause species to give rise to two or more descendant species in the future. So here is an example looking at some insects that are varying colors of gray. So you've got light gray ones, dark gray ones, and their habitat is dark color here. So the bird that comes along is able to see the lighter colored ones easier. So he's going to eat those first. They're easier to pick off. What's going to happen is the darker ones are going to survive better, and they're going to go on to reproduce. So what you would see is over time an increased frequency of the darker traits that enhances the survival rate and it has a greater reproductive success. So when we study things in science, we use the scientific method, or it's a way of using scientific inquiry that attempts to keep things fairly unbiased and objective as much as possible. So science is just a way of understanding the natural world. Inquiry is the search for information and explanation. So in the process of studying science, we're going to make some observations, we make a hypothesis, and then we test the hypothesis. It starts out with a lot of observations. We use your senses to gather information. You also will use tools to help pick up things that your senses don't. For example, none of our senses can perceive radiation. However, we can create tools that will sense radiation for us to be able to observe it. Your data is your recorded observations. Some of it may be qualitative, some may be quantitative. Qualitative is going to be descriptive in nature rather than numerical, where quantitative is more numerical. It is easier to deal with quantitative data. If you're looking at something that's qualitative, if I hold up a flower and I want you to describe what color pink it is, Everybody that is around, everybody in the room may give a different description of that color pink. Some may think it's more orange, some may think it's more red, others may see more purple in it. That is going to be much harder to get a consistent description of. If I ask you how many flowers there are and there's just one, we can all agree that there's just one. So you can get a little bit more agreement in the quantitative data. When we use reasoning, there's inductive and deductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning derives generalizations from a large number of specific observations rather than applying generalizations to explain specifics. You have to be careful with this because it could lead you down the wrong road. So if, for example, you were to go someplace and say you went to a forest par forested park in Washington and you said, okay, I can see what's going on here in this park. All of these plants here have flowers, so I'm going to make the generalization that all plants in Washington State have flowers. That's not true. If you were to go somewhere else, you could look and see, all right, here's we have a lot of plants that don't have flowers. So inductive reasoning can lead you into trouble. Deductive reasoning is a little bit easier to use. You're going to use the generalizations to try and explain the specific. So both of them have their limitations, and we have to be careful how we use reasoning. 
your hypothesis is the tentative answer to a well-framed question. It's going to build in some deductive reasoning and logic. So when we say a well-framed question, hypotheses are actually very well researched before they're tested. A lot of times we try and give people, we, we tell kids about science, we say it's an educated guess. You need to be really educated on it. And nobody is going to want to pay for research unless there is a good bit of evidence that has led you down that pathway to think that. They're going to want to see some supportive evidence before they're going to want to pay for that. So lots of observations are used. We use a lot of information from previous researchers in trying to figure out our explanation here that we want to test. And sometimes your hypothesis goes well and what you're testing gets proved. Other times it doesn't. It's not a loss if your hypothesis is not true. It's just taking one of the possibilities off the table. And in a lot of cases, you just go back and modify. So here in this example, you see we've got somebody making the observations. She looks and goes, oh, my flashlight's not working. So it leads to the question, does my flashlight have dead batteries or does it have a burnout bulb? So in her first prediction, she says replacing the batteries will fix the problem. Replaces the battery, tests the prediction, and it comes out to be false. She looks and, okay, the flashlight's not working. So she goes back and revises her hypothesis here and says, all right, let's change the bulb. Well, replacing the bulb that fixed the problem. She tests the prediction, and the test does not falsify the hypothesis. It's going to work. So when we look at questions that can be addressed by science, they have to be testable. If you can't test it, science isn't even going to try and work on it. The other thing is it does need to be falsifiable. There has to be a way that we can reveal if an idea is not true. There are some things that science does not get involved with. They're outside the bounds of science. So things like the supernatural, religion, and personal faith. So it isn't that science says, no, those things don't exist. Science says, I don't have the tools to explain this, so I am not going to attempt to do it. So with the scientific method, this is your idealized process of inquiry. This is what you'll be working on in one of your labs. It does allow for some flexibility for more observation, but it does try and keep things repeatable and allows you to redirect when necessary. So when writing up a scientific procedure, you want to make sure that you're very clear so that if someone else repeats your study, they can do it exactly the same way you do. If you leave things up for question and interpretation, they may do something different and then get different results, which would invalidate your work. So it's really important to make sure that instructions are very clear and don't leave open that possibility. So when we're looking at things, you're going to have an experimental group and a control group. Your experimental group is going to be the one that receives a test or manipulation. You're going to do something to them to see what happens. The control group is the one that you don't do anything to. They're used as a basis for comparison. So you can see what would have happened if you had manipulated the situation anyway. So in a controlled experiment, you're going to have a an experimental group and a control group. That's ideal. That is not always the case. So when we're looking at these things, remember these are under ideal circumstances. Sometimes ethical concerns are not going to allow us to have ideal circumstances. If you wanted to test something on a patient that had cancer, you need to find people who already have the cancer. You can't give a group of people the cancer just to test to them. That's not ethical. Your variables are the factors in the environment. You want to minimize the difference in these variables. So there are two variables we look at. So you're going to have your, I'm going to type them in here. You're going to need to add them into your notes. So you're going to have your dependent variable. This is going to be what you are looking for to change.
and then you're going to have your independent variables. This is going to be what you manipulate to see if there is a change. So these two things, I recommend you write them in in your notes because they are not going to be printed in your notes that you print out. So an example of an independent variable would be having a, you want to test a drug. So that's going to be the drug that you give the person to see if there is a change in, say, you're doing a drug that affects blood pressure. Give them the drug. The dependent variable is what you're looking to see if changes. You're observing their blood pressure to see if it changes. So the theory, this is going to be used differently in science than it is from everyday language. Everyday language implies speculation, but in science, something that's a theory is much broader than a hypothesis. It's well supported. There's a great body of evidence behind it. But when we use it in casual everyday language and you're ex talking with your friends, and you say, I have a theory as to why this happens, you're really implying a lot of speculation and unknown in there. So with science, most scientists are going to work together in teams. We find that having cooperation and diverse viewpoints is really helpful. So if you're working in teams, you must be good communicators. In science, we try and build on the work of others, rather than reinventing the wheel. So the effects of Tylenol on pain have been well studied. Nobody's interested in you studying the effects of Tylenol on pain again and redoing the other work. We want to learn something new, so we're building on the work of what somebody else has done. By having a diverse group, you're going to be asking different questions and viewing things from different angles. If you imagine you're writing a paper and then you go back and you proofread it, you're probably going to miss most of the mistakes in there. Well, if somebody else proofreads your work, they don't have the expectation that everything was already correct. They haven't already written those sentences so that when they look at them, they actually have to read them. Their mind isn't filling them in ahead of time and they're going to be more likely to pick up those mistakes. Same thing with science. If you have different eyes looking at it, different eyes are going to pick up different things. Science and technology are really tied in society. Science aims to understand the natural phenomena. Technology is more of the application of science. It's trying to use it for a specific purpose. Sometimes it's for good, sometimes it's not for bad, but they are inherently tied together.